Sonic. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Better. <laughs> better, better, better. Okay, on your seat you're going to find a little snapshot bio of our guest speaker. Our guest speaker is from Oakfield, that she became a star. <laughs> okay, so you've got plenty of information about her, and I'm going to say that I grew up in the same area as Kate. Uh, my children played Oakfield. They graduated from Pavilion, both my son and daughter. My daughter played Little League also. <laughs> she was a catcher. And she did a number one in the playoffs, and then I got shoved at home plate and a concussion. So we ended up in Albany Medical Center for a couple days. So I can really relate and um, welcome our guest, Kate Brown. Okay, one of the things that I want to say about Kate is this for you. They all knew Kate Brownell was a good baseball player. She was so good that one spring day in 2005, when she was 11 years old, and the only girl in Oakfield's Little League program, Kate pitched a perfect, perfect game. Meaning she struck out all 18 boys. Let's hear it. <laughs> Came to the plate. The exceptional rare feat at any level of sports created an onslaught of national attention and an avalanche of local jealousy. Here is Kate to tell you her story. Goodbye. Um, some of you may have heard my name before, or for some of you, it's going to be the first time hearing it. For those of you that don't know me, I'm from a small town in western New York, where there's just one stoplight and more cows than humans. And yes, I am an 11 year old girl that redefined what a perfect game is. I struck out all 18 batters that stepped up to the plate in the 6 inning boys Little League game on May 14, 2005. As the only girl in the league and the first person to achieve this accomplishment, you can bet I face plenty of adversity to get to where I am today. And that adversity extends far beyond striking out 18 boys. In fact, that was the easy part. I'm here today because although at the time I didn't want to, I donated my jersey to the National Baseball Hall of Fame, where I became the youngest person ever to be inducted. I'll get back to that shortly. Let's go back to the beginning to see how I got there. I was born on June 22nd, 1993. That wasn't supposed to happen. Although it killed my mom to admit, but at the time, she didn't think she could handle another child. She was basically a single mom raising three boys while my dad was over the road working as a truck driver five days a week, trying to support our family. In the most recent article written about me, my mom said in an, in an interview, when I was pregnant with her, I used to pray to God to take her because I couldn't handle another child by myself, and he didn't. And for that, my mom is forever grateful. And let's be honest, I'm obviously her favorite child. <laughs> when my mom became pregnant with me, her sister who became my godmother would tell her all the time that she's finally having the little girl that she wanted and that she would be something special. My Aunt Sandy promised her that, what, that she would help my mom raise me if she needed her to and that she would always be there for me. And that she was, but for just a short six years. With an unsteady home life and having just lost one of the most important people in my childhood to cancer, I fell into a deep depression at just six years old. I would go to school and cry every single day to my fourth grade teacher. I remember asking her about death and wanting to go there because I wanted to be with her, with my godmother. I tried counseling, I tried writing in a journal, I tried everything to shake the pain of losing someone so important to me, but I couldn't until I found sports. Playing sports was the only thing that, I, that could take my mind off the pain and allow me to be myself and breathe freely. <coughs> Growing up in a male-dominant household with three older brothers definitely had its perks. They taught me how to be tough, stand up for what I believe in, and of course, being the baby and the only girl, I was their favorite too. I always wanted to do whatever they did, so I would play football, basketball, baseball, anything I could get my hands on to be just like them. I went as far as wanting to eat every time that they ate. <laughs> I worked my way up to weighing 165 pounds by the time I was a junior in high school. <laughs> I started playing baseball at the age of five with both girls and boys. In the town I played in, you had a choice of playing baseball or softball at age nine. The girls were supposed to play softball and the boys were supposed to play baseball, but not for me. I like to defy the odds. When the time came for me to pick, 
I remember watching the softball field and thinking there was no way I thought they'd play with them. The girls were barely making the ball over the plate. It was like a very go round on the bases from all the walks. It just didn't seem like my cup of tea. And I wanted to play on the same team as my brothers anyway. Baseball seemed a bit more competitive for me, so my parents allowed me to play with the boys. I'm sure it made my mom's life a lot easier not having to travel to three different fields to watch her kids play. As a nine-year-old competing with the boys up to age 12, you can bet it wasn't a smooth ride. I was starting over some of the boys, and of course, parents and players didn't like that. I ended up taunting Sweetie like, you're on the wrong field, softball is over there, or you're really a man, baseball is for boys, and also you don't belong here. I never fought back or tried to stick up for myself. I was very quiet growing up, so I just tried to let the comments roll off my shoulders, which is always easier said than done. What was even harder was being so excited to see my name on the All-Stars list after the first year, but because I was a girl, I didn't make it. My coach was not happy with that, so he went to bat for me at the board meeting and said I should, be I should not be treated differently because I'm a girl. Every coach in the league knew that I was the best nine-year-old to play, but because they didn't want to hurt the boys' egos, I didn't make it. But that's okay, though, that they know two years later I put a small town on the map. So let's fast forward to the day that changed my life. May 14th, 2005, just a few days after tossing a one-hitter in my opening day debut, I woke up and got dressed the same way I did before any other game. Left sock first, then my right, I put my sliding shorts on, then my gray uniform pants. I always had to wear that long sleeve under my shirt beneath my number three Dodgers jersey. Before I left my room, I always looked up at the poster hanging in my room of Derek Jeter that, that said, Dream Big. I showed up to the field a few hours before the game, for picture day, I was told I'd be splitting time with my friend John at shortstop. I was going to start the game on the mound and he would finish it, but that didn't happen thanks to my scorekeeper. After completing the first three innings of three up, three down, the scorekeeper approached my head coach and said, you can't take her out, she's pitching a perfect game. I didn't realize any of that at the time. I was just told there'd be no changes and that I was still on the mound. And I had absolutely no idea that my life was about to change drastically in just three more innings. I just went with the flow and continued to toss the ball over the plate. After the fourth inning, I was sitting three more boys down. My mom, or I asked my mom to bring me a Gatorade. Free scream, of course, my favorite. I still remember the excitement and smile on her face through the fence as she was like, Bug, you're throwing a perfect game. And I was like, yeah, okay, mom. Whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking to myself, I didn't even know what that was. I told her thanks for the drink and just went back to doing my thing. Now we're down to the wire, sixth inning. The last batter of the game is up. He bailed off three balls behind the backstop. Of course, I'm not nervous or anything because I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, we were up by 11 runs, and I didn't have a clue that on one more pitch I was watching make history. I was just doing what I love to do, and that was play baseball. I threw the final pitch, strike three. My coaches and teammates ran to me and were crowded around me, hugging me, telling me I did it, and I just said, did what? <laughs> everyone was trying to explain to me how exceptionally rare it is to do such a thing. Usually there's a walk here or there where a batter puts the ball in fair territory, but to strike out every single batter in just 73 pitches, I guess, was kind of a big deal. So big that what was about to happen to an 11-year-old was more like a dream than real life. I called my dad, who was over the road, to tell him what had happened, but he didn't believe me. He said it wasn't possible, so I gave him the phone to my mom. <laughs> my mom told him that I wasn't joking, so he immediately called the president of the league to tell him to get a hold of our local newspaper. And sure enough, it was Media Central after that first story. Every local news station was at the field interviewing me the next day. I was so shy, though, I didn't speak more than just a few words to each interview. Shortly after we left the field and went home, News, news 8 was parked outside my house knocking on the door. I remember hiding and not answering the door because I was so overwhelmed with the media in my face. I went to school that Monday and had kids that I never talked to before tell me that I was a hero and how awesome I was. And of course, there were those negative Nancys that had mean things to say to me that I didn't deserve the attention or the only reason why I was getting it was because I was a girl. Not even mentioning it, uh, the fact that it had never been done before by either gender. But again, I let it roll off my shoulders, and not much to say, and just smiled and walked away. For the next few months, at the baseball field, I had several kids asking me to sign their jerseys. Gloves, balls, and hats. I even had one kid asking me to sign his stomach, which was kind of weird. But I, did that anyway. I thought I remember too much of my sixth grade year because I was constantly being taken out of classes to do interviews, 
on the radio with ESPN, Good Morning America, Fox News, and so many other media outlets. The Los Angeles Dodgers called, the New York Mets called, the President of the United States called, the Little League Baseball Hall of Fame called, as well as Cooperstown, the Baseball Hall of Fame here in Cooperstown, Cosmo Girl Top 10 Born to Lead, Ellen DeGeneres, David Letterman, the New York Times, and ESPN called, along with a few other big names. I remember when Cooperstown called, I was not happy. My mom and I were sitting in a parking lot, heading into a store when the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame called. She said, oh, I'm sure she would love to, as she covered up the phone to tell me that the Baseball Hall of Fame wanted me to donate my jersey. I, my 11-year-old self told her, no way, that's mine, and I'm not letting anyone have it. <laughs> She's like, Kate, this is the Baseball Hall of Fame. We're only the best go, like Babe Ruth. I'm sure we can get you a new one. <laughs> so I finally came in and agreed to let go of my jersey. On July 7th, 2005, I was inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame when Maria Pepe, one of the first girls to ever play Little League, stood by my side as I got inducted. One of my other favorite memories came just a few months after the induction. The LA Dodgers flew me and my entire family out to California for a couple days so I could throw out the first pitch before the game against the Mets. While talking to Tommy Lasorda, the owner surprised me with an authentic brown hall, number three jersey to replace the jersey that I didn't want to give up. <laughs> right before I ran out into the field to throw the first pitch, I remember looking around feeling like I was in a movie. The sound of the fans, the amount of people cheering for me, it was an incredible feeling. I received very strict instructions though before running out onto the field to not go on top of the mound and don't ruin the dirt for the pitcher before the game. So of course I'm a real follower and I did what I was supposed to, but Jeff Ken didn't want me to. He got down into a stance behind the plate uh, ready to receive the pitch, but saw that I was standing in front of the mound, not on top. He stood up and waved me back to go on top of the mound. I was hesitant at first, but as he turned around towards the crowd to wave his hands up and up and down, the crowd got super loud, so I turned around and walked up to the top of the mound. I kicked a little bit of dirt and threw a strike right into his net. <laughs> Not everything was sunshine and rainbows through this experience, though. There were plenty of hardships I had overcome during this feat, and even before. Once I tossed that perfect game, the insults came flooding in. Not only from players, but from parents now. Grown adults talking about how I'm not deserving of this attention, or how it's only because I'm a girl, even though no other human being, male or female, had done what I'd done. My mom hated hearing those comments as she sat in the stands and wanted so badly to speak her mind and stick up for me, but I always held her back because it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth the headache of letting them know that they had the upper hand. I just let my play speak for itself, and it did. I went out of play baseball until I was 16 years old before transitioning to softball in high school due to my school not allowing females to play baseball. Even though the baseball coach told me that if I could play, I would have made the team. But playing with the girls was an awesome experience. I was named captain of the team and was a two-time All-Region All-Star. My senior year we made history winning our conference and advancing divisionals for the first time ever. I always took some of the younger girls under my wing that needed a little extra help than most of us other girls because I wanted them to never give up and never quit on the game because they weren't as good as some of the other kids. I would stay with them and hit extra ground balls or toss front toss just to make sure that they were getting better too. After high school ball, I attended Buffalo State College where I was a four-year starter on the softball team and became the first person in my family to graduate college. As a player, I was a four-time SUNYAC All-Academic Team honoree, named to the SUNYAC Commissioner's List, was a first-time All-SUNYAC selection, and earned all ECAC first-time honors, first-team honors. The summer before my senior year of college, I received the worst phone call ever from my mom. It was on a Saturday morning. I remember rolling over to look at my phone and thought, hmm, that's weird, she's calling at 6 in the morning. I answered the call, and she immediately told me that my dad was in a really bad car accident near Syracuse. My stomach dropped, tears immediately ran down my face. She told me that he had hit a trailer full of kerosene tanks and that he wasn't doing well. The whole drive back to my mom's, I remember wondering how I was going to be able to finish college if I had just lost my dad. Even though I didn't get to see him as often as I wanted growing up because of how selfless and hardworking of a man he was to support our family, losing him would have destroyed me. 
I remember wanting out of the place that I had lost so many meaning, meaningful people in my life. I wanted to start fresh somewhere. When we got to the hospital, I remember looking at my dad and thinking, that's not my dad. It didn't look like my dad. My dad shouldn't be lying here in front of me. I wanted so bad to give up at this point. But I knew I couldn't. I knew I was put on this earth for a reason. After several surgeries, skin grafting, and physical therapy, my dad learned to walk again and is here with us today. In May 2015, I graduated from Buffalo State College and had no idea what career I wanted to pursue. I just knew I didn't want to live in Buffalo anymore. <laughs> My girlfriend at the time moved to Massachusetts a semester before I graduated to be the assistant at softball coach at Amherst College, which was a perfect opportunity for me to escape and start fresh. So the day I graduated, I loaded up the car and moved to Massachusetts. I was feeling every emotion you could think of. Scared, excited, and nervous. I was leaving behind three little nieces that looked up to me and a family that I love more than anything. But I couldn't wait to meet new people and see what life had in store for me. I was blinded by love and riding on a high, escaping that working for the first few months wasn't really in my interest, although I still had some a bank account. <laughs> All the jobs that I found were desk jobs, which I knew I wasn't going to like. I can't even sit through an eight hour or through a movie, let alone an eight hour work day. <laughs> I had interned with a strength conditioning coach in college, and my brother was a personal trainer, so I thought, why not me? I love helping people and I love fitness. It would be the perfect job. Although I didn't have much money or a job, I took a leap of faith and signed up for the, my personal training certification. A few months later, I became a certified personal trainer with no training job in sight. I went through a few random jobs that made me question my decision about moving before stumbling upon my dream job, being an assistant softball coach at the collegiate level. I started working as a catching coach voluntarily at Amherst College while working another job. I completely fell in love with developing the players and giving back to the game that gave me everything. Coaching to me was more than just improving their softball skills. Being able to make an impact on 18 girls every single day was so humbling for me I was able to help instill confidence in each of these girls and teach them how to be leaders on and off the field. My first year of coaching, we made it to the NESCAC playoffs for the first time in four years while finishing third in the league. Following a great coaching debut, I was asked to come on board full time and be the program's main assistant coach. At Amherst, we built a culture of women that can lead. With almost the entire team returning for my second season, the leadership really shined through as we finished second in the NESCAC championship and earned a bid to the NCAA Division III Women's College World Series in Oklahoma City for the first time ever in the program's history. Being a softball coach never felt like work to me. I would jump up every morning when my alarm went off for work, ready to go inspire and impact a few more girls each day. It was my dream job. I remember calling my mom and telling her about all the girls and how much I loved it and how I would do this for free every single day. My bank account quickly looked like I was doing it for free. <laughs> While coaching, I had to work several different jobs just to make ends meet. I was working as a personal trainer on the side, giving private softball lessons to local high school girls, and was working in the sports information office as well. So I was up from about 5 a.m. until about 9 or 10, working nonstop. Sometimes if there were home games, I'd stay even later. Needless to say, two years later of exhaustion and nothing to show for, I had to bite the bullet and quit my dream job. The summer before I quit, I was looking for my next job when I started, or when I stumbled upon a full-time position as a certified personal trainer at the Edge Fitness Clubs in Connecticut. It was about time the certification I got three years prior was going to come in handy. I sent in an application and received a call to come in for an interview. Before I left the interview, I was offered the position that day. Scared and nervous to start another new career path and move to another state yet again, I immediately accepted the challenge and took the position. Working in a male dominant industry, I wasn't sure if I was going to be that successful as a girl competing with other male trainers in my business. But that wasn't the case. When I went to the Trainers Academy, they told me that it would be about a three month grace period because most people don't hit success until about three or four months. I didn't want to be like most people, so once I heard that, you bet I was going to hit that in less than three. I did it in about eight weeks. Over the last year and a half, 
I've been one of, if not the most successful trainer at my club. I'm the only person in the club to ever reach $4,000 in product sales, as well as being the only person in my club chosen to earn a trip to the owner of Doc Fitz's house in California. But being successful at that in the spectrum doesn't mean half as much as, much as watching my clients succeed and see their success stories. Over the last year and a half, I've helped change numerous people's lives physically, mentally, and emotionally. Being a personal trainer is more than just telling someone what exercises they need to do. It's motivating and inspiring them every single day, building relationships with them, leading them down the right path to success, and showing them that it can be done. That's what I love about my job. One of my very first clients has lost over 70 pounds, won two challenges, and no longer has to pay $2,000 in medical, medical bills a month. That's a big win. But what's even more important to me is watching my female clients who are so nervous to step on the gym floor because of how intimidating it can be, walk through the doors excited to work out every day with confidence. From playing baseball to collegiate coaching to now personal training, I've always seemed to put myself in a male-dominant setting. But I've always come out on top. From being so successful in whatever avenue I took, I believe that men are finally treating me with the same respect as they do other men. Whenever they find out that my jersey hangs in the Hall of Fame, they're always so impressed and think that it's the coolest thing in the world <laughs> that I'm in the Baseball Hall of Fame. <laughs> so many times I question myself and my ability to succeed being a girl in those settings, but I've always persevered past the adversity that stuck in my way and kept paving the way for other females to follow. Every summer I go home to watch my nieces play baseball at the same park I pushed them the game at, and every time a kid recognizes me and comes running up to me for an autograph. It's a really awesome feeling, especially when they're girls. My life by no means has been perfect, and I still struggle. And honestly, standing here today to tell my story is both humbling and nerve wracking. I do it because I hope, as women and as people, we can all learn something from each other. And today is my turn to share my story. I'm happy to report that my story is in a happy and hopeful place now. After 31 years of highs and lows and rocky roads for my parents, they have been happily married for almost three years now. <laughs> I have one nephew and four beautiful nieces that are my motivation every single day to be the best role model that I can be. I got out of a four-year toxic relationship that I felt trapped and stuck in, only to find my beautiful girlfriend and best friend here supporting me today. I have been asked to share my story and speak to an all-girls high school. That has been the most humbling experience yet. They were both excited. They were like, so excited intrigued and touched by my story. I even had a few girls stay after to talk to me about how they could relate to some parts of my story and just thank me for giving them hope getting through the hard times. In my bio at work, I placed a quote in there that I think many people can relate to and it reads, when you mix visualization with determination, you will see yourself rise above adversity. So no matter what tries to get in your way, don't let it just keep rising above. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Okay.